Today we are in the Gospel of Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 27. Hear the words of the Lord. And the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Bezabal, and by the ruler of the demons, he cast out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, the house can be plundered. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's holy word. We are in the first Sunday of June. We are almost halfway through the year. And today for a sermonic theme on this third Sunday of Pentecost, I'd like to use the theme, A House United. A House United. A mom gets older. She has two kids surviving that tend to her and care for her. One of her kids lives in the suburb and one lives in the city. The one who lives in the suburb is the primary caretaker over mom and her finances. He grows a little bit weary and talks to the sibling of his that lives in the city and says it's time for you to take care of mom some. And so they move mom to the city and he allows his sister to be over the care of mom and over mom's finances. Well, time passes and mom dies. It is time to bury mom. The brother asks the sister to take care of the arrangements since she is over the money. There is a painful silence. The sister is unable to take care of the money because during hard times, or maybe not so hard times, but whatever the case is of the times, she has spent all of the money, all of it. There is nothing left. The brother is mortified. He is so disgusted with his sister. How could she spend mom's money? They beg and ask other family members, and so they slowly are able to raise enough money so that they are able to bury their mom. But after the funeral is over, after all the stuff of taking care of mom, of getting her buried, the brother never speaks to his sister again. A house divided. The kids, <clears throat> The kids in this household, if they want anything, they know they are to go to parent B. Parent A will say no for sure. But if they go to parent B, well, it's their only hope because they also know that parent B has the ability to persuade parent A. And if parent B really wants it, parent B will totally override parent A. But this wasn't taught to them in a book. Somehow these kids know instinctively how it works with their parents. Family dynamics are interesting, and when there is family conflict, it makes the family less stable, less strong, less able to endure the storm. It's not rocket scientists that family challenges weakens the family's ability to protect and support all of its members. A house divided cannot stand. This phrase not only can be used in family dynamics, but it was used often in our American history. A house divided cannot stay. Most remember this from the 1858 speech of Abraham Lincoln at the Republican Convention in Springfield, Illinois. Though not a conservative or even an abolitionist, he could see a tear in the country and recognize if that there was nothing done to stop. The country would become totally divided. Abraham admitted for those pushing into a liberal space 
that if I could save the Union without freeing the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save the Union by not freeing the slaves, I would do it. I don't know if I said that right, but you get what I'm trying to say. He believed that freeing the slaves would save the Union. And so he spoke these words, a house divided will not stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in ourselves of ultimate extension, or its advocates will push it forward till it should become like lawful in all of the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. I have a beautiful dress I love. I hadn't worn it in years, but the other day when I was asked to bring a certain garment to a function, I knew that this dress was the ticket. I love the fabric and the feel of it and that it was made on my mother continent. I loved it so much I bought it right off the back of someone I saw while I was in Senegal. I loved it so much that I'd wear it and it feel just right on me. And so before I was about to go to this event, I decided to put it on to see if it could handle all my COVID weight. I discovered a big gaping hole allowing a cool breeze to flow directly to my skin. But here's the thing. It didn't start out with that big hole that now allowed the cold breeze to flow directly to my skin. It was first a nag and then a tear and it grew and it grew and it grew. And now what we have, what we have is a real big hole. We have a big hole in our country, but it didn't start out as a big hole. It started out as a tear. Maybe it went all the way back to Lincoln. We have not dealt with what tears and now like our ancestors, we are face to face with the recognition that a house divided cannot stand. This is where we enter the biblical text today. The community is getting stirred up by Jesus. He is performing miracles and speaking parables and engaging people in a way that is exciting and yet it's unsettling. And so the people are talking. That's what people do. The religious leaders are talking. That's what leaders do. The Israelites are talking. That's what ethnicities do. They are talking about this man named Jesus. Who is he? Where does he come from? And how does he do the things that he does? They were excited, but they were also unsettled. Outside, they begin to talk about Jesus. They say he is the ruler of demons. They call him insane, crazy, cuckoo. And Jesus can no longer hold back. Jesus enters the conversation, though he was in the house with his family. Perhaps Jesus got triggered hearing them talk about him in the way they did. The family tries to restrain him out of concern for him, and Jesus gives them all a piece of his mind. You peons, how can Satan cast out Satan? A house divided will fall. In other words, you cannot work against yourself. You cannot be on both sides of the fence. You cannot be for and against something at the same time. The notion of allegiance and standing for something is Jesus' stamp on the people. Watch how you talk about me, Jesus concludes. There is a hole and something has been tearing at Jesus for a while. 
Conflict happens. We do not see eye to eye. We are differently abled and have access to different parts of God's spirit. We have walked different paths in life, and sometimes there is baggage and tidying that is needed, but we lug it around anyway because it holds some sentimental value to us. We bring all of us what is seen and what is not seen to our context. Sometimes, often, we are perplexed because of what people do because something that is not seen is operating in our sisters, in our brothers, in our non-binary folks. But spiritual maturity, Pentecost inflamed spiritual touch, allows us to recognize that there are differences, that we hear others, and that we are willing to do the self-work that we need to do and to recognize our larger common good. Years ago, I led a book club for a decade and what united us was we would come together and discuss a book. But at some point, the participants enjoyed talking more and not necessarily reading the book that had been assigned. So we would show up at events and half the group would have read the book and half not and it made discussion a little bit hard. And at some point, someone said, we like to gather, but we're not really interested anymore in reading the books. And so we did for a year a DIY, a do-it-yourself kind of project. Each month we had a different interest, but eventually the group dissolved. And the group dissolved because the thing that held us together no longer did, and we didn't replace it with something. As the church, we sometimes forget what brings us together. We didn't just happen to show up. And sometimes we don't just happen to like each other, but we work at it because what brings us together is God. We are united by a common story that settles on us. We are drawn into a community that professes at its core that we are so touched by the good news of Jesus that it has radically altered the way we live our life. We have decided to follow Jesus as best we can. We rely on the Holy Spirit for help, but love and grace and mercy are our superpowers and we use them daily. People of all shapes and colors and sizes and understandings are drawn to United. And that is the one amazing story. It takes work to keep us united. United doesn't happen by accident. We work together, and when tears come, in the best of circumstances, we address them quickly with the help of our PPRC committee that helps us to better understand each other because a house divided cannot stand. And so we are a house united. Someone once told me, instead of saying things in the negative, you say them in the positive. So the negative is, a house divided cannot stand. But the positive of that is we can stand united. One of the things that helps us to stand and be a house united is working together. There are a few groups that meet for spiritual food and others that meet to have an impact on the larger world in our church. All of our groups give us the wonderful opportunity to move beyond Sunday to learn more about Jesus, experience community, deepen our roots, and serve our world. It is not just enough for us to come on Sunday, and get to the table, and eat. Many of you know this through COVID. It's not good just to get at the table and eat. But you got to put some of that protein and some of the energy you get to work. Teamwork gets the job done. And one of the things that blesses me about United is how committees work together to get the job done. If you aren't serving presently, you are missing out. Because there's a lot of things that happen from Monday to su Sunday where we struggle, but we work together and it makes us family. Our media team could use more folks working with us. Sharing God's love could use more folk working on our team. Experiencing God's love could use more people on their team. Celebrating God's love could use more people. Our Sunday school, our youth program could use more people. And if you didn't know some of these names, you need to get more involved because we talk about this all the time. 
We not only want members, we don't want people just to sit at home or sit in our pews, but we want people to get involved because we need you. And when you get involved, you work together with a group of people to bring the kingdom of God to earth. I just started watching this week, Tidying Up. It's a TV series by Marie Kono. She's a Japanese sister, and she has this way of bringing order to homes. And so when she goes into the home, the first thing she does is she greets the home. When she gets down on her knees, it feels a little bit spiritual to me. And it's like, you know, she's having a moment where she's just connecting with the home, letting the home know, hey, I'm here to help you out. These people have not been necessarily nice to you, but I'm here to help you. And it's a moment of silence. And it appears that as the people in the home are watching her, like they're getting a Pentecost experience themselves. And so she has a system. And I've gotten down step one, step number one. And so I can share this with you. She starts by taking all of the clothes out of the closet and putting them on the bed. And for some people, like, it's amazing how many clothes. And I think that's what she wants. She wants them to see how many clothes they have collected and their clothes like stacked up. Some clothes with tickets that have never been worn, but lots and lots of clothes, no matter what home she goes in, in this area, everybody has lots of clothes. And she says, this is the art of getting connected with your clothes. And then she asks them to pick out one clothing item that brings them joy. And so she begins to help them declutter and tidy by saying, what are the clothes that bring you joy and disconnecting from those that don't? But here's the amazing thing about Marie Kono. She gets the family to work together. She says that the work of getting and keeping a tidying home will depend on every family member, not just the one person. And so you see folks, you see families that haven't really been talking to one another, working together, getting closer, and learning so much about each other through their things. But here's the thing she does, she gets them to work together. Let us never underestimate the power of working together and working for each other. Let us never forget that. There are so many self-help books that tell you how to love up on yourself, how to do you, how to care for you. But in my quiet time this week, I got this epiphany for God. What if instead of everybody ensuring that they took care of their own self, what if we all decided to take care of somebody else? What if we all were working to make the world better for another group or another people? Okay, maybe I didn't make sense right there, but I want to share with you an a experiment a professor did that made a lot of sense and bring home what I'm talking about, a house united, where people care for one another and work together. There was this professor, and he did a balloon project with his students. So he got all of his students together from all of his classes, and he inflated balloons and he had each of them to write their name on a balloon. And then in a school hallway, he mixed all of the balloons up. And then the students were given five minutes to find their own balloon. Despite a hectic search and people pushing and eager and anxiety, no one found their balloon. You see, they were all doing what we do in America they were doing themselves. After that experiment didn't work, the professor said, I want to try a different experience. Let's make this experiment about others. At that point, the professor told the students they now had a new assignment. Instead of looking for a balloon that had their name on it, they were to take up the first balloon they found and hand it to the person whose name was written on it. Within five minutes, everyone had their balloon. The professor said to the students, these balloons are like happiness. We will never find it if everyone is looking for their own happiness. But if we care about other people, we care about their happiness, and if we care about their well-being, we'll find ours too. 
a house united. It calls for sacrifice. It calls for sometimes, they're not gonna play the song that I like, but I know that it blesses someone else. And sometimes they're gonna speak a language that's hard for me, but I know that that language blesses someone else. That things won't always go the way I want, but I know and see the larger picture because I've picked up somebody else's balloon. It's an acknowledgement that conflict will come, but when we see the tear, we won't wait. We won't let that tear continue. We'll address it as soon as possible. And always wanting to work with others to spread the message of good news to the world. Let's find each other's balloons. Let's be united. Let's keep doing the work of justice and grace. Let's be united. Let's be equipped by the Holy Spirit. Let's be united in the world. Amen. <laughs>